Uh, thanks everyone for coming along to, to the meeting today. Um, I hope you've been having a, a nice time so far. Um, it's always a great joy for me to come back to this uh, theatre, um, it being uh, you know, of the same era as uh, the, the uh, Rutherford and uh, when the, all the fine experiments were done during that period. And as Peter mentioned this morning, it's particularly appropriate that we should be having our meeting in this lecture theatre because the date, it was officially opened on the 1st of March 1912, literally a few weeks before Bohr arrived in Manchester. So this would have been a bright and sparkling new, new um, uh, building and department, um, probably in contrast to the grimy other buildings around, around the, this area. Um, <clears throat> uh, so, yes, it's, it's, it's good to be back. Um, I'll cut a, a, a long story in short and I just say that the aim of my talk today is to set the scene for the following two uh, lectures from our distinguished visitors, Finn and John. And the, uh, essentially I'll be talking about um, what, what was, when Bohr and Mosley came to Manchester, what, what would it have been like, where they lived, what was going on in the laboratory and so on. So I'm going to start with... Uh, what the laboratory was like before Rutherford arrived, so I've called that Schuster in Manchester, but between 1900 when the building opened and Rutherford arrived. Then I'll talk about the, the, the very important early period when Rutherford came here between 1907 and 1910, um, how Rutherford reorganised the laboratory from Rutherford's original plan. Then talk a bit about Mosley, the two years that Mosley spent in, in, in Manchester. Um, and I'm, I'll also come back to the 1912 extension, which is where we're having this lecture, <coughs> and then say a little bit about the, 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 that first early critical period of the, when Bohr first came to Manchester. So, starting with the first period then, um, what this shows is a street plan of the original Owens College from the 1893 Ordnance Survey map. Here you can see Oxford Road. Uh, this is Coupland Street here. And uh, here is the original Owens College building. Um, and you can see that it's essentially where we are based now, it was mainly uh, sort of old Victorian terraces. I think this looks a bit like a, an old um, shed or something like that, or a, a yard of some kind. Um, but yeah, essentially it's, it's mainly, mainly old, old terrace uh, houses. Um, you can see, yeah, there's the, the, also on Oxford Road is this tramway, which was a very central feature of Manchester. And you can also see that the tramway, as well as running down the main artery of Oxford Road, also ran down Coupon Street, so it was literally was a tram line running up here, and also the, at the adjacent street, um, uh, Burlington Street. Um, and we're, in fact, the, I, for those of you who came on the tour this morning, um, there's Eagle Street, okay, so that's, that's where we were standing um, this morning, was, was where, where that, that street was. Um, this is a, a lovely uh, early photograph of Owens College. Um, it's probably early 1900s. Um, I can tell that because um, the, the um, Whitworth building dates from 1900. And you can see that here's the trams running down the middle of the street. And this is just after electrification, which was in 1901. So this is early, early 1900s. That's, this is the image you would have seen then. Um, if you came up um, Coupon Street at that time, this is an image you might have seen um, of the old uh, medical school. You can just see the, the old tram, tramway there. That's the image that's just, just across the street from, from, from here. So we, now let's jump ahead 10 years. We've got the, this is the Ordnance Survey map from 1908. Here is the um, Oxford Road with the tramway. Here's the Owens College. Now you can see there's already been some development here. Here's the Whitworth building, which wasn't in the earlier photograph. And here is the, the laboratory, uh, um, um, the 1900 laboratory. You can see there's the main shape, there's the quadrangle. Um, again, there's still a few terraced houses around there. Eagle Street is still fully open. Um, uh, but, but at that time, the trams have been diverted to other directions. So you've got, you've got the Burlington Street tram and you've got this other tramway going, going this way. Um, this sh uh, picture shows the architect's drawing um, of the 1900 uh, physical laboratory. Um, and this is actually taken from a program um, that was given out to the public when they came to the, the, the building for its official opening. Um, 
And it's actually, it's, it's a very interesting document. It uh, contains lots of information about what would have been in the rooms at the time, including, um, for those of you who came on the tour this morning, that, um, uh, from this I worked out that, I, that, 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 that that room on the first floor was used for um, refreshments, so one can infer that. That may well have been the tea room at the time. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's what it would have looked like in, in 1900. Now I've already shown you the plans of the building when, when I took you on the tour this morning, so I'm not going to repeat that. What I'm going to show you is what I believe, um, uh, how the, what I think the building was used for. Um, so here is a picture of Arthur Schuster in the, in the large lecture theatre. This picture was taken in 1905. It was in the same series um, of uh, uh, photographs in, in Nature that featured some of the famous professors of the, of the day. And it's the same period as that famous picture of Rutherford in his cellar in, in, in the Montreal laboratory. Um, here are some of those instruments that I talked about, talked about um, that would have been used on, on, uh, at the end of the building here. So you've got a heliostat that was used to direct light into the grating room. This is a Roland grating, which looked, may, may well uh, have been very similar to the one that was the large grating that was kept in this room. And this photograph here, I'm sure it's not very good quality, but um, it's actually Arthur Schuster in the transit room with the trans instrument in that bay window that I, I, I took you to see uh, this morning. Um, this is one of my favourite photographs from uh, the early period. This is um, Arthur Schuster taken in the Dynamo Hall in 1903. This was the period when, uh, it was just before the uh, British Association meeting, meeting in Southport where famously the, the origin of atomic energy was first discussed. Um, it also includes um, uh, some other famous visitors to the laboratory at that time, including Boltzmann and several other august uh, uh, gentlemen of 19th century physics. And it also includes uh, a very um, happy-looking Frederick Soddy, um, who had ju uh, ju just at that time uh, 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 carried out experiments with w William Ramsey in London to, to demonstrate the evolution of helium from radium. And that was considered to be a very important experiment uh, at the time. <coughs> Um, so, yeah, that's a, lo a lovely old uh, photograph um, taken in the Dynamo Hall. Um, the, the, you just see the, the, the doorway there. Um, now, it very, it, it very, what's very interesting about 1903 um, is that um, it was the year when radium first became easily available. And, it, uh, and the, the radium craze was, was started off. And, of course, um, f uh, uh, another story, another lecture, Frederick Soddy... Um, had obtained um, famously a supply of radium from a, a, a shop in London. No doubt he, 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 he uh, sort of, um, his, his enthusiasm was spread throughout his, his contacts and Arthur Schuster did not want to be uh, left out of this, so Arthur Schuster got himself some radium. Uh, this is actually a receipt um, for 20 milligrams of radium bromide, which he obtained from a shop in London called Armbrex and Nelson. Armbrex and Nelson still exists today. It's, it's um, a homeopathist. Um, in those days, you could buy radium, and you could also buy a thorium inhaler if you, if, if, for, for, uh, for your asthma condition. Uh, um, uh, this is the picture taken around. Th th this is the same series as the Schuster picture I've just showed. It's the same, it's the same uh, period of 1905. I, I show this one because even though it's not Manchester, it shows Rutherford in his laboratory. It also demonstrates how ra the radium was kept on, uh, in solution on a, on a mercury pump and, it was, uh, and the gas was milked off o o o o over mercury. I mention this because as I, when I took you around the, the this morning, I showed you where the radium room was. The apparatus in there would have been very, very similar to that. Um, um, okay, so moving on. This is another very uh, nice photograph. Of, this is the physics department, physics and electrotechnics um, in 1906, taken in the old quadrangle that I showed you on the tour. Here's the, the, um, the, the old goods entrance that was locked up in 1920. Um, so here's, here's the, the department. Um, it's Arthur Schuster, um, Thomas, is it Thomas Roscoe? Or was it William Roscoe? Thomas Roscoe. <coughs> um, um, Henry Roscoe. Oops, sorry. <laughs> um, there's also some other characters in here as well, which I've attempted to circle, but for some reason it's got displaced. But, here we, uh, these are young men who were physics students or 
uh, postgraduate uh, people here prior to Rutherford, who then went on to work with Rutherford. So here's Walter McAvoy, uh, Sidney Russ, um, uh, Thomas Royds. Um, I can't remember who that other character is, um, but um, he, he was one of the people that stayed on. Um, so that's, that's if you like, uh, my, my um, lightning tour through um, Schuster's uh, uh, period in Manchester. So let's then go up to, to Rutherford's time. Um, very, a very important uh, occurrence in Rutherford's uh, occupation of the building was uh, his acquisition of a large source of radium in 1908, um, and this is actually uh, taken from Rutherford's notes. You, it's his handwriting, which records the entry of, of, the, of the radium. I can just re read that briefly, um, um, though, for those of you not familiar with Rutherford's handwriting. Um, yeah, so it's titled, Experiments with Austrian Radium, received uh, by Otto Brill, Saturday, February the 14th, 1908. Radium weight 3.95 grams of uh, radium barium chloride uh, received in quartz tube with stopper. Uh, that he then measures the strength of the source by measuring how much radium emanation came off it. it he used, uh, a, a, which is radium emanation being radon, he used a electroscope that was designed to measure the activity of, of radio <coughs> emanation. It seems remarkable today that you'd measure the strength of a source by how much radioactive gas was coming off, but that's what he did. Um, and he compared it with the radium uh, bromide standard using the, the, the typical elect electroscope um, uh, method where you, you, you measure the natural leak rate and then you, you put in your standard and measure the rate and then you compare it with your source and you do the calculation. That gives you an estimate of how much radium there was. So he estimated, um, uh, actually, another, I'm going to refer to this later. Look, the natural leak rate. And John, John, and I, John and I is already in on this one, but uh, the leak rate is 0.19 divisions per minute. Okay. Um, uh, so he, he estimated that the source was about equivalent to 450 milligrams of radium bromide, which is equivalent um, in elemental radium to, to uh, uh, about 243 milligrams. Okay. So that's, that was the, the actual source that he had. It was 230 equivalent to 243 milligrams of ra pure radium. Um, so as, as I explained this morning, um, the first thing he needed to do was find somewhere to put the radium. And so he put that, um, he chose the transit room, which I took up this morning, and he assembled his apparatus there, the, the pump and the purification apparatus. He also hired William Lansbury um, to be the technician to work in that room. So that, Lansbury's job was to uh, look after the radium and prepare the sources. Um, at that time, William Kay was also, uh, he, he took up our occupation of the, the preparation room just behind um, the, the, the lecture thing. So there were two very important characters at, on that top floor. Um, <clears throat> um, yes, yeah, so as I mentioned also this morning, that, that transit room, which then became the radium room, was also the room where the famous Rutherford and Royds experiment was, was conducted. Um, that, that apparatus, or something at least which purports to be the apparatus, still exists or is on display in the Cavendish uh, Museum. Um, actually, if, if, you, if, if anyone's ever studied that and you look at the diagram and compare it with the actual bit of glass, they don't match up. Um, actually, well, I, I think this is actually what it would have looked like. It was a much more complicated, complex set of pieces. It would have had its own mercury pump um, and uh, uh, you know, uh, um, certainly would have, it would have been... You know, looked something a bit more like that. But that's another story. Um, so, yeah, so uh, just shortly after that Rutherford Roy's experiment hit, this is the physics group in 1909. There's Rutherford Schuster and the, the, the usual characters that we're, we're now familiar with uh, you know, Geiger, Marsden, Mackerel, etc. So, uh, as, as, as I mentioned also this morning in the tour, um, Rutherford also. Uh, commandeered the basement for research. Geiger's room was the, the, the old liquid air room, and this, this is a photograph, the famous photograph that was taken in, in that room. That was a bit later in 1912, but um, it would have looked up in 1910 when, or 1909, 1910 when Mosley arrived, it would have looked a, a, a bit like that. Um, 
So again, I'm, I've already shown you that diagram, so I'm not going to go spend much time talking about it. Another lovely photograph from about that time. Uh, this is before the 1912 extension. So at the, at, at, on, on the uh, 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 western side of, of the building was uh, some sheds, including a, a chemical shed for doing really dirty radiochemistry. <laughs> and that was the time when uh, Boltwood was here. So. Um, yeah, there would have been some serious radiochemistry going at that time. Um, so here, here again, some of the uh, people we know, um, uh, uh, William Kay, William Lansbury, the two technicians, uh, uh, Guy, but of course, and various other characters from that period. Um, okay, so that was a kind of lightning uh, kind of introduction to what the laboratory as it was when Mosley first arrived in, in Manchester. Um, so, um, the first thing that Mosley needed to do when he got here was find somewhere to live, and he, he clearly was unhappy with his first place because he then got to, uh, found a, a, a place to live, um, which he stayed in for about two years, called Dunwood House in Withington. Uh, this is a, another uh, 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 image from the, uh, the 1894 Ordnance Survey. I'm, just, I'm sorry, there's not much detail on, 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 on there. It's, it, it's a bit blurry, but at least it gives you an impression of the, the overall pattern of the overall geography. So here's the centre of Manchester. Here is the, uh, the college. You can just see the quadrangle there. Um, and this is the road uh, which um, starts off Oxford Road and then turns into Winslow Road. This is the journey that he would have had to take down to to, to Withington, to, 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 to Dunwood House. Uh, Rutherford's house was just, just about here. Um, uh, so it's interesting, yeah, he, when he took this journey, he would have been going past Rutherford's house um, every day, uh, coming in and out of work. And he mentions um, in his letters that Rutherford had been very kind, he invited him to the house, and he'd even taken him on, on a motor ride. And he, he, he get, in his letters, very interesting, he tells you quite a lot about how he, his pe the people he met um, at uh, uh, his, his residence. Um, and very interesting, he says, um, yeah, the house is uh, run by clockwork um, and the keeper is averse to deviations. Um, the most troublesome feature is the distance from the college, half an hour a walk or 15 or 20 minutes tram or more, as the road has always uh, been up, resulting in delay. Now, one thing I became intrigued about was um, what it would have looked like for Mosley on that journey from uh, the laboratory to, 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 um, to, Withing to Withington. And what I've been able to do from a local website, a history uh, site um, devoted to Russia, is put together a sequence of images uh, that, that, that take us through, through that journey. So I'm going to go through this quite quickly, but it, it, will, be, it, it will give you an impression. So the first one, this is um, a tram, uh, not one of the old electric, early electric trams. This is taken in Russia. Just off, this, this is uh, Whitworth Park here. And Hume Hall is just over here. Okay. Um, so this, at that time, it was, it was, uh, it was a theater, there was a theatre there. Um, so th this is very much like Mosley would have seen it. So now I'm going to take through a sequence of images which take us on that journey. This is further up Wil Winslow Road in the middle of um, Rush Home. Um, this is a bit further into <coughs> Rush Home. There's a church, that Rush Home Church, which is destroyed in the 1950s, I think. Um, OK, then we're getting to uh, this area here, which is um, opposite Platt Fields. There's the church in the background. Um, and then we come to this photograph here, which is right in the middle of the Platfields area. And at this, at this time, in Mosley's day, it was called the, the Boulevard, the Rush Home Boulevard. It's very hard to imagine from the, the, looking at the Curry Mile today that this could ever be considered a boulevard. But apparently it was very popular with, with uh, the Victorian uh, early, early um, so 19th century, uh, 20th century uh, visitor. Um, <clears throat> And so here we go, further, fur, fur, further into, um, on the way to, to Withington. A very interesting old postcard. It was sent in about 1903, I think it was, to a friend. And it's interesting to read this. Um, the way to Withington, it is prettiest in summer, though um, I, 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 um, I was nearly lost in a fog last Wednesday. <laughs> so, um, Manchester was very famous for its smogs in those days, and of course Mosley um, experienced <coughs> that himself. So here's a, just coming into uh, with, uh, Fallowfield. Um, it's coming into Fallowfield Village. Um, some of these buildings still exist, by the way. Um, that's Fallowfield's train station. Here's the, the tram coming through here. 
Another view from the Fallowfield train station. Um, and then finally, this is my last in the sequence. Uh, this is with a view out to Withington. Uh, this, actually, this building still exists. Um, there's a pub opposite you can view it from. Uh, this was the view that you would have seen up, up into Withington. And Rutherford's house was just literally around the corner here. Uh, so, yeah. So that was uh, Mosley's journey um, um, that he, he, he would have been very familiar with. Uh, yeah, so I mentioned the, 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 uh, the smogs, and that's one thing that Mosley comments on a lot. Uh, the climate here is unusual, uh, but not so bad as pictured. The last 10 days have been, there have been two brown fogs, one white, one bright frosty day, one snow, five rain, but never a, 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 a day long. Um, this is lovely here, this one. Today the fog is so thick that I shall probably get lost on the way to the college. It tastes acrid and tickles the throat. Yesterday the tram in which I came back lost itself badly and I finally got out somewhere and groped for a side street in which to find a street name which luckily I recognised. Monday the fog was thinner but more yellow. So here is Withington. I've not, despite um, uh, m much effort I've not been able to find Dunwood House. There are plenty of other uh, places in here uh, uh, called you know, lodges and houses so it would have been here somewhere. Uh, I've also noted here, that, that was the location of Rutherford's house. So I, as I said, he, he, as I noted earlier, he, he actually, when he was in Dunwood House, he was really quite close to Rutherford. And he was certainly close to Rutherford at the time when Rutherford first articulated his famous scattering war. This is a picture of Rutherford's house taken um, uh, a few years ago. Um, uh, and this is a picture of Rutherford outside his house with his, his motor car, which he purchased from his... Um, um, his um, Nobel Prize money. Um, <laughs> and, uh, as you know, later, l later uh, it was famously later dubbed the, the Sunday night that changed physics. Uh, the, the, the Rutherford's old boys, when they came up to Manchester in 1961, described, in, including Darwin, who we heard this morning, described that he was actually there at, at Rutherford's house for a dinner when he rather famously came down and announced that he, he, he'd got this uh, uh, formula. So Mosley would have been around at the time. He, he, would, he, he would have gone past this house uh, every day on his way into college. Um, there, of course, is the Rutherford's famous scattering law, um, which, of course, was composed in the winter of 1910 um, and, of course, not 1911, as, as commonly thought. Because uh, we know about the, the scattering law, so I'm not going to dwell on that. We had a meeting last week, uh, sorry, last year to celebrate that. And what I... Well, I've, I've talked about where Mosley lived and his journey into uh, um, the college. I've picked out a couple of very interesting other snippets from his letters which describe his experience in, in the laboratory because it's very instructive about how, how, how things were done. I love this one here. So his, Mosley, we know, as I explained this morning, he's working in the basement uh, just a few doors up from Geiger's room in, in the room underneath what's now called the Rutherford room. Um, and he describes this um, in a letter of um, shortly before Rutherford uh, announces his, uh, or around about the same time that Rutherford announces his scattering law. <coughs> my work is going through much tribulation. On Thursday, I at last induced my apparatus to stay at a pressure of one over 400 millimetres. Um, then I started my experiment. But a glass <coughs> tube of thinness or thickness, much less than tissue paper, filled with radium emanation, chose to break off its stalk inside and everything had to come to pieces to get it out. Fishing for a thing which breaks at a touch was too risky to be tried, for to let emanation loose upon the laboratory is a capital offence. <laughs> so, rather, rather famously sort of uh, had these very strict rules about uh, let, um, you know, the need to avoid uh, escape of uh, radium emanation, because it, it would, of course, the, the, the whole laboratory would be rendered useless for, for the, the time when it was there. Um, here's another, I, lo I love this one, this is my favourite. Um, okay, so I'm, this is a year later. Um, I'm writing in a, a laboratory so steam heated that even with a coat off, it is hardly bearable. And at the same time, I'm waiting for an experiment to repair itself. At present, beta ray experiments, which must be got through while my supply of emanation lasts. The experiment is now clamoring for attention, and I must go to it, for I have many things, uh, many, I have to do many things in a minimum of time, but it seems more like a conjuring trick than anything else. The experiment begins in the attic, that's the room, transit room at the top, where I showed you, and continues in my room on the ground floor, he actually means the basement, uh, so that I have to race down three flights of stairs in the middle to the great astonishment of the occasional student. 
So, so that literally how it was done. The, the, the experiment, the, the sources were created in that room at the top, and he would literally, holding the source, would rush down those three flights of stairs, down into the basement, and, and put the source into the apparatus to do the experiment. I find that, that, that is remarkable. Um, so, yeah, moving on. Um, Mosley, he moved around a bit. He, he uh, clearly, the, the, the strain of coming in from Withington was too much, so he, he, he moved house much closer to what is now Hathersage Road, but what, what, what um, then was called High Street. So he, he, and he moved, this is a picture of High Street here, there's um, Wimslow Road, that's um, Whitworth Park. Um, so he moved house a few times um, along that road. Now I was going to uh, tell a little joke here, a little anecdote, because um, our speaker, Finn um, Usred, was planning to stay in the Imperial Hotel uh, on Hathstage Road. And so there was a change of plan. And it so happens that this uh, is 157, um, and it was right next door to 159, which is where one of um, Mosley's houses was. So, for, for what I thought, uh, Finn might be attracted by the kind of historicity of the location, but um, greater, well, wiser counsel prevailed, and he, he um, moved to the, uh, the, the business school. Um, so this takes me up to 1912. Um, now, I've already showed you around the, um, <clears throat> uh, the building, so you've got a basic idea of the, the plan. This is uh, another programme that was produced for the public for a, a spectacular opening of the extensions. Um, and uh, the whole of the laboratory was thrown open to the public, um, including this new um, uh, building, or as new as it was then. Um, there were exhibitions through, throughout the whole, the whole uh, place. It was quite spectacular. Um, and this, of course, was, as I mentioned right at the beginning, just only a few weeks before Bohr arrived in Manchester. Um, the um, experiments included... Uh, in the basement, and Ge Geiger actually was also demonstrating, and he had a little demonstration called Counting Atoms, which in, in that day must have been you know, quite, quite remarkable. This particular room was de dedicated to Osborne Reynolds, the engineer who uh, sadly died, um, uh, uh, um, um, or as Rutherford uh, put it in his letter to Boltwood, he pegged it um, <coughs> just before the opening, and in honour of, uh, of, honor of Osborne uh, Reynolds, they, the, this room, there was a special uh, um, uh, demonstration in this very lecture theatre uh, of, of some of his uh, fluid mechanical um, uh, uh, discoveries. But you can imagine, it was, it, was, it, was, it was a spectacular display, and it was so successful they had to run it for an extra day. Um, but you can imagine that uh, for a new arrival, uh, a bore, it must have been very impressive. This is the new laboratory as it was then, um, there's Eagle Street. Remember, I, t and I took you on a tour this morning. I showed you that, that entrance. Because uh, we're, we're now sitting in this, this area here. Um, this is the famous 1912 photograph, which you've already seen today. Um, and so I, know, I don't need to um, spend any more time going over that. Um, but this is yeah, the, the group of people that were, were active in the department when Bohr, Bohr arrived. So I have a couple of other interesting things to say about the 1912 extension. Um, this, uh, one thing I didn't mention this morning was, in addition to all of the electrotechnical rooms, there was on the outside this little room called a, 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 a chemical laboratory. It was a radiochemical laboratory that was designed to be outside the main part of the laboratory because it was dirty stuff. It was intended to avoid uh, contamination. And um, interestingly, um, in my um, uh, uh, study, uh, uh, research, in, in this case, uh, I was doing some work on, on Soddy, actually, the Soddy manuscripts which are held at Oxford. I chanced upon this photograph of, of the, the chemist Russell that was in those papers. And this is one of the very rare photographs uh, we have of people actually working inside the building. There, um, and this is one I found. So that's, that, that's a lovely little photograph of Russell in, in, in that chemical shed. Um, uh, um, so, um, now the story of the contamination, I've already told before, and I've already given a lecture on this, and I, the, at the meeting last year I, I spoke at length about it, but for those of you not familiar with it, let me just briefly uh, tell you that the, in addition to the problem of overcrowding that there undoubtedly was, 
due to the massive influx of research students. One of the other reasons why it was necessary to build the extension was because the original laboratory had, by 1912, become so contaminated, despite all the Rutherford's efforts and all the strict regulations, uh, it had become contaminated to the extent that it wasn't possible to do certain experiments. So um, the, uh, as part of the new extension, six new lovely uncontaminated rooms were, were set aside for physics. Uh, I, I can... I can I've got a couple of quotes here which describe that. So I think this is Schuster describing the, the opening, at the opening. Um, the physics research rooms marked 8 in the plans are situated on the first floor of the north wing facing Bridge Street. In this position, they are well outside the range of penetrating radiations from the active material in the main building, which is some 30 yards further south. I mean, it's extraordinary. They thought they had to get 30 yards away to, to get um, uh, away from the radiation. Primarily intended for experiments in connection with radioactivity, they are nevertheless equally well adapted for other branches of physics. And here's Rutherford also. This, I think this is in his report to the Council of 1912. A part of the new extension was set aside for the use of the physics department. The rooms so provided have already proved of great service to research work. The new laboratory has the great advantage of being free from radioactive contamination, and it's thus been possible to carry out refined experiments which would have been very difficult in the main laboratory. Yeah, as, as, as those of you who came to the last meeting, I, I actually gave an entire lecture devoted to that question, and I wrote a paper which is published in the, in the last newsletter. Um, so you can read about that uh, at your leisure if you, if, at a later time. But I'm not going to say any more about that um, very much, but I, I'll come back to the issue um, briefly later on. Okay, so this is, this is how the laboratory... This is a kind of a picture of the laboratory as it was when Bohr arrived. Uh, Bohr, when he arrived, also had to find somewhere to, 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 uh, uh, to live. And he, he chose to live in Hume Hall, um, where he stayed between March and July of 1912. Um, and the way I think of Hume Hall is that if, if one thinks of Rutherford's house in uh, Withington as the birthplace of the nucleus, one can also think of Hume Hall as the, the birthplace of the quantum atom. Uh, one can think that. You may disagree. Um, there are, uh, both, it's interesting at the time when I started looking into this, um, uh, Jeff Hughes was also investigating, uh, and we both at the same time found this um, interesting uh, entry in the Hume Hall uh, logbook uh, or, or residence book. This is uh, dated from uh, 1902. 6 to 1916, and here is the, 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 board, board, the entry for, for Niels Hendrik David Bohr. Gives his birth date, where he comes from, and it briefly says um, uh, he's, yeah, he's, come, he's come here to work uh, with Professor Rutherford in the Manchester Laboratories after work with J. J., Sir J.J. J. Thompson at Cambridge. It says he, he, he arrived April 1912 and he left to get married in Copenhagen in, in July 1912. Um, there's, there's a few other little bore things which are, <coughs> I, I, I know that Jeff uncovered, which I, I'm not going to talk about today, but I'm sure it's, it's excellent uh, in, and interesting material for, a, for another lecture. Um, so here is the High Street as it was in 19, this is a 1922 Ordnance Survey, and it shows the location of Hume Hall here. Because Hume Hall, actually, despite its appearance, is not very old in that location. It really was only, I think, just a year or so before Bohr arrived, that it was re relocated to this spot here. Um, um, so interestingly... Um, is that in Coalfield? It's, no, it's, th this is, this is uh, Whitworth Park here. That's, that's Hathersage Road now. It's closer than Coalfield, yeah. It's, it's very, it, oh yes, this is, this is Rushon. Yes, just... just um, in fact, I've got some other images that I'll show you. So, so at that time, he was actually living very close to Mosley and well, it, it sort of potentially raises interesting. One could speculate, but possibly, about whether uh, the fact that they were neighbours could have led to some interaction, but the evidence is, is, is not very strong for that, as I'm sure John will tell us about later. Um, now, in the same way, I try to recreate what Mosley would have seen when he journeyed to the college. I, tr I tried to do a similar thing uh, in a smaller scale for, for Bohr. Uh, this is actually a picture of, um, of the tram coming Round the corner, uh, at, uh, th this is um, Oxford Road here, going into uh, Wormslow Road. Uh, this is 
uh, the uh, Whitworth Park. So when he, came, when he came out of, if I go back to the previous slide, he, came, he would have come out of Hume Hall, he would have walked up Rush Home Place, and on this corner there, he might have seen that tram coming around the corner there. Then he would have started his journey into college, um, and when he got here, he would have seen the very new, newly built St. Mary's Hospital. Um, that's, how it might, that's how it looked uh, in, in Boar's time. And the, also the, the new Royal Infirmary. So it, at that time, you've you got the new Whitworth Park, you've got the, uh, the, 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 the lovely um, uh, building of St. Mary's Hospital. It would have been uh, not an unpleasant journey, a uh, short walk for, for Boar to take into, the co into college. So, uh, that is the, the last topic that I'm going to talk about, and I think I am on time. Um, I'm well on time, in fact. Uh, so I might just, just take a little more time out of this, because it's particularly interesting. So, Gore <coughs> arrives in Manchester, and like everybody else, it is expected that he, he should attend the, uh, the radioactivity training course, which by then was been, had been running for several years. It was uh, famously run by some of the senior people in the department, including Geiger and uh, Makawa. And interesting, I have, sorry, I'm going off camera a bit here. Um, I have one of the original textbooks, uh, which was clearly, which presented to the library by Makawa. Um, it's a very interesting book. It described, it's called um, Experiments in Radioactivity. And it would have been a, t a textbook that would have been used by students at that time. Um, now, having spent many now, by this time, many um, uh, years uh, uh, handling um, radio art artefacts, as I call them, I, 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 of course, as soon as I see something like this, I think, yeah, OK, I've got to check that it's, it's not radioactive. Um, <laughs> because it's clearly quite a, a very well-used book. I mean, some of the pages, uh, are clearly, it looks like somebody spilt their coffee on it or something like that, um, it, as you'll see. But I can assure you, it's perfectly safe. It's not active. I, I tested it. Um, I can test it again if you, if you, if you want my, my, my assurance, but I, what I thought I'd do is just pass that round so you can ha have, have a look. Um, I also passed around a copy of Rutherford's 1912 textbook, which came out at the same time, or shortly after Bohr arrived. Uh, another great, great work of Rutherford's, which became a standard textbook. Um, so let me pass that down too. So, Rutherford, so Bohr's here. Um, he comes to the laboratory for the first time. He gets put on the, the, the training course. Now, as I explained on the tour this morning, I'm pretty sure that it was done in this room. Uh, for those of you who weren't on the tour, the reason why I think it was this one was because we know from other sources that this room was used as a refreshment room, certainly when it was thrown over to the public. Um, and we also know from the anecdotes that the, the training room doubled up as the departmental tea room. So it's kind of... You know, and the fact is, it's right. It's next door to the elementary laboratory, so it is a certain logic. I can't, I can't prove it was there, but it's a pretty good guess that that's that's where it was. Irrespective of where it actually was, we we we, we do have a, a very lov lovely uh, uh, historical um, artifacts from from that time, um, which include Bohr's own notebook that he 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 uh, which recorded these experiments. And uh, what's of particular fascinating fascination for the local uh, historian uh, is that we also, in, Man in the Manchester archives, have a similar notebook that was um, recorded by a student called Doris Bailey, who uh, made her entries in about a, a year prior to the war. She graduated with a first class degree in 1912, then went on to do postgraduate work. Um, so, yeah. I, I thought it was just interesting to compare the two notes and you know, see what information one could get from that. And uh, you open the book up and you see page one, lesson number one, the alpha ray electroscope. Okay, there's a nice diagram of an electroscope. It tells you all about the theory of it. And very importantly, um, if you're going to use the thing, you, knew, you need to know how to calibrate it to get a linear scale. And also, of course, to take into account the background leakage of radiation, the, leak, leak, the natural leak, as it's called. And you probably can't see there, but um, when, she, when Doris Bailey calibrated her instrument, it had a leak rate of 1.1 divisions per minute. Now, if you can compare that to Rutherford's uh, 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 emanation electroscope um, a few years earlier, which was 0.1 division. So that's already telling us something about the conditions in the laboratory. 
Uh, this is the equivalent page in, in Bohr's notebook. Um, uh, one of the things I found about Bohr's notebook is much more terse than the Doris Bailey's. Doris Bailey's had very florid, full explanation, but Bohr seems to get straight down to the numbers very quickly. Um, so that's, it's interesting from that perspective. But there's also something else that's very interesting about this. Uh, you can see that in addition to Bohr's handwriting, there's also some other handwriting. Uh, this is the person who evaluated Bohr's work. So if you, if you look through it, you can see that it's mainly pencil ticks saying, yeah, correct, 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 correct. The, 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 whoever uh, wrote this also made a very, another very interesting observation. Um, uh, so the electroscope is probably contaminated. The natural leak should be less than 0.1 in a non-radioactive laboratory. Now, I have, I, I've spent many um, uh, hours looking through Rutherford's notebooks, and I'm pretty sure that's Rutherford that wrote that. Um, John made a screen, but... Uh, um, so, yeah, that, 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 that's interesting. It's interesting from a number of perspectives because, um, you know, you've got the... Why, why was Rutherford correcting this note? Why, why was he evaluating it when you would have thought that um, Mac Macauer or Geiger or Marsden, uh, those guys would have been d doing it? Um, why, why, you know, perhaps Rutherford did uh, evaluate all of them. That perhaps the standard procedure, I don't know. But um, it raises some interesting speculations. So let me, but just continuing through, I could spend a whole lecture on these notebooks, fascinating notebooks, but unfortunately I'm running out of time and I want to stay on time. In fact, I may be ahead of time, which is good. Um, so lesson number two is the absorption of alpha rays from polonium. So they, you, you have your polonium source, you, you, you measure its strength um, without, without any uh, absorbers, then you gradually add different absorb, absorbers, you do your calculation, and you get your, get, get your nice cur absorption curve. Um, that, that was, that, that was a, a very, be very beautiful curve done by Doris Bailey. Uh, this is Bohr's, Bohr's equivalent page. Um, the, the, all, all the calculations are all perfectly correct, and that, that, that's his curve there. Um, I think, yeah, at this point, I'm, I'm going, to, I'm going to, to come to an end, because I've achieved my purpose in setting the scene for uh, the following two speakers. But I would, my last or penultimate slide is this one. I hope I'm not treading on the toes of either Finn or John. Um, earlier I said that I, I had reason to, to think of Hume Hall as the birthplace of the quantum atom. And my, my, my argument in, in, in for that is that uh, we, we know, of course, the, the, the document that, uh, which Bohr produced, which then which became um, after... Uh, Kuhn and Harbron's paper from the 1960s where they describe this document as the Rutherford Memorandum or the Ball Rutherford Memorandum. This document was composed in Hume Hall. And although, of course, this was prior to his discovery of the Balmer formula, he, it, what he, he, during that time he had already uh, used uh, Planck's constant to stabilise the electronic orbit. So this is his special hypothesis. And that special hypothesis was first put together in Hume Hall. Um, so that's my, 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 uh, the evidence I use for my case of Hume Hall being the birthplace of the quantum atom. So I think I should stop here now. As I said, I've, I've, I've achieved my aim, at least I hope I have, of setting the scene. Um, so 1913, when Bohr came back, uh, the, this was the, uh, the, the, the departmental photograph taken at the famous entrance that we went to see this morning. Um, and uh, um, I th that, of course, was the year when uh, Bohr uh, published um, his famous trilogy. Um, and, uh, uh, of course, it's, it's, it's unfortunate that there are no, very few pictures of Bohr from that time. Um, although, we, of course, we have Mo Moseley, Moseley is here um, in, the, in this picture. Uh, as, is, as is Darwin, whose dulcet tones you, you heard a sample of this morning. So I think at that point I really ought to stop and um, uh, hand over to our, our learned uh, speakers um, to continue. Um, but I believe I am, um, uh, well, there is a little time for questions. <laughs>